Shabbat, everybody. <laughs> nice to be back. Thank you for inviting us. Um, some of you have heard my stories before, so I apologize. <laughs> You're going to be hearing the same thing again, but um, some of you haven't, perhaps. So um, I'm just going to tell you stories of my childhood with Baba. Um, as I think you know, uh, my father was Adi Jr., Baba's youngest brother. And uh, Franey, of course, is my mother. And I met Baba three times. Uh, once I was a baby, and Franey will tell you that story. And then I met him when I was seven in 1963. Was it 63 or 64? 63. And then again when I was 11, in 1968, 69, shortly before he dropped his body, we went to India in 68, 69 for Dara and Amrit's wedding. Dara is my brother and Baba had arranged that wedding. And I don't know if I'll have time to get to that, um, that part of my time with Baba, but I'll just start and keep going. So, um, as I said, I had met him as a baby. Um, Adi was the only member of Baba's family to move away from India, to, you know, to move to the West. And I was the only one of Baba's nephews or nieces to be born and raised in the West. So my experience with Baba and as a member of Baba's family was inevitably different than that of my cousins because of the geographical distance. Um, like Leatrice said, you know, I, I just always grew up having a, having a sense of Baba being someone very important. His photos are, are all over our house, were all over our house. Um, I knew that we were different. Um, we lived in London. Um, uh, England is, you know, the official religion is Church of England. Things have changed a little now, but when I went to school, there was certainly no such thing as a separation of religion and state. You know, I went to a private school. It was a Church of England school. Our house, which as Franey said, Baba named, was called Mare Manzel. Our house was um, almost probably to the inch, right in the middle um, of this beautiful street and there was the vicarage at one end and the church at the other end and here was our house right there. So the Church of England and Jesus, you know, they were, uh, I was very aware of them. Anyway, um, when I approached my seventh birthday, um, my parents felt it was time to go to India. I, I believe Baba had said, you know, children shouldn't come until they're seven and they had abided by that with the exception of Franey taking me as a baby. And it also just so happened to coincide with um, the Zoroastrian uh, celebration or ceremony of sort of induction into the Zoroastrian faith, sim similar to a Christian confirmation, called a Naujot ceremony. And I'm sure most of you know Baba was actually a Zoroastrian, and so were my maternal grandparents. Uh, Franey's mother loved Baba very much and actually brought Franey to Baba. Franey's father respected Baba tremendously, but he was a devout Zoroastrian. He was Sara Shirani's brother. And uh, Dinshaw, my maternal grandfather, had a very important you know, standing in Ahmednagar in the community. And it was very important to him that his granddaughter, especially his granddaughter who had sort of you know, gone to England, should follow this Zoroastrian tradition. So um, Franey and Adi wrote to Baba and asked Baba if it was all right because nothing was done without Baba's permission at all, asked Baba if it was all right for us to come to India, for me to have a full-blown, you know, Naujat ceremony that would be in keeping with my grandfather's sort of position in the town. And Baba, of course, said yes. So that was sort of the catalyst for getting us to India at that time. But really, what was the real thing was to see Baba. So, um, you know, this big trip was planned. We ended up going for three months and um, I, was, I took time off school. So, you know, my father thought he should probably sit me down and tell me about Baba and why we were going to <coughs> India. And I was a very, um, you know, I was quite a reserved, quite well behaved, you know, little English girl. And um, I remember he, my, my dad was very clever, you know, he knew exactly what to say and he didn't say too much. Um, but he sat me down and he said, you know, Shireen, you know that you go to a school where you say prayers and there's an assembly and you know that people here love Jesus. Well, Mayor Baba is Jesus. He is um, Jesus come back and um, he's God in human form and also he's your uncle. <laughs> and, um, and you know, amazingly, as a seven-year-old, that just made absolute sense. There was nothing, you know, nothing sort of strange. And I remember thinking, oh, you know, oh, and then being, 
interested and almost like I knew that that was the case, um, but my dad just saying it very succinctly, I respected my father tremendously, his word was law, uh, so I had no doubts. And then he said, we're going to India and we're going to meet him, and you know, he just laid the groundwork. So I was extremely excited. And um, before our trip, um, it's amazing how, you know, when you're seven, <laughs> that means something. And then I met Baba even four years later, how you, you change and your it, sort of mental processes change. But at seven, it was just a very simple thing. Baba was my uncle. He was also God. It was very exciting. I was going to meet him. So I remember going to my little school and uh, my best friend, I called her over and I said, I'm going to India to meet God. She was absolutely didn't bat an eyelid, you know. And um, I said, uh, we talked about it and, and I, we came up together with one question for Baba. I asked Baba many questions when I went to India when I was seven, but one particular question we formulated together. So that was sort of my approach, you know. This was, and you know, in my mind, it's, it's, it's a little hard to explain, but Baba was, at age seven, I think, you know, you have a concept of God and, and God is love. He's loving God. He's God the Father. But I also thought, well, you know, I believed very ardently in Father Christmas and you name it, you know, I believe magicians and witches. So Baba was, you know, he was going to be a combination of a loving God, um, you know, my favorite uncle already, even though I hadn't met him really, and a magician. And he was going to answer all my questions and it was just going to be wonderful. So anyway, we went. And my father, as the time approached for our departure, he very slowly, you know, told me a few more things. Told me about the Naudrit ceremony and told me that Baba likes entertainment. Anybody who's been with Baba knows that that's sort of a prerequisite, you know, of um, providing Baba with some entertainment. I was talentless, but I had to come up with something. And, um, but my dad, most importantly, told me how I should greet Baba. And he explained that Baba was, you know, elderly and frail and that he needed his rest and his quiet and that I shouldn't be, um, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't hug him, I shouldn't sit on his lap, I shouldn't be rambunctious, and I, I think I was hardly rambunctious anyway, but um, this was my father's sort of preparation. So we flew to India, um, Franey and I stayed with my grandparents, Franey's parents. My father stayed at Merazard with Baba's, he always did, and I was immediately jealous of that. And Dara stayed with his aunt, Vilu. So, um, after a day or two, Baba called us and, um, you know, I can still remember the tremendous excitement I felt. I mean, there's nothing that has really compared, you know, since then of getting ready to meet Baba and he sent his car and it was a big American car and that was so exciting, just for starters, you know, to be in a car that somebody else was driving, not my father. And Franey, it was the 60s, so I was very dressed up, you know, in my little, whatever, my sort of frou-frou type dress and I had really long hair and Franey put it in ringlets and I was dressed up to the nines and I just remember you know the excitement of um, all of us and all of us meaning Franey, Dara, my parents, Franey's parents, Vilu and Saraj, there was an entourage, we were an entourage of people going to meet Baba and there was sort of a fleet of cars and there were garlands everywhere and of course I'd never seen so many flowers so anyway we got in the car and we drove um, first to the trust office and um, went into Adi Senior's office, and I, I imagine some of you have done that um, in the old days. And Adi Senior had a very little office at the trust office, and I remember um, his wall was plastered with photos with Baba, and he had a glass top desk, and there were photos of Baba underneath the glass. And I remember looking, and there was Baba as I thought Baba should look, um, you know, older with the plait. And then there were photos of Baba as a young man, you know, even behind, like the image behind me. And I was looking and I thought, oh, you know, I, I was a bit, I was a little bit uh, taken aback by Baba as a young man because I think in our house we only had Baba sort of, you know, as he was um, then. I mean, the, the images were of his current age. And as a young man, Baba looked a little stern to me. And I remember looking and, and um, feeling a bit concerned and thinking, which Baba am I going to meet? And I asked Adi Senior, and he laughed, of course, and said, well, of course, the old Baba, you know, how could it be the young Baba if, he's, if his photos have been taken as the older Baba? So I was very relieved. And um, then uh, we got in the car, and then we made our way to Marazad. And, you know, um, just driving, you know, where you get to the point at Marazad, 
and you enter the gate and then there's a sign that says private road and then you drive down that road and I mean every time which is not that often unfortunately but we go there you know it still of course brings back that first feeling of just the thrill of driving down this road and knowing that Baba was going to be at the other end and it seemed like a very long road and the car was a very big car and um, so we arrived at the back where Mandalay Hall is and so for the first time since I was a baby, I was greeted, and I say I, you know, when you're seven, you're sort of the center of your own universe. And even like you said, Leatrice, I mean, you tend not to, no when you're with Barbara, you actually tend not to notice what's happening with other people. So I was greeted, you know, in my mind, but we were all there um, by all the ladies. You know, it was the first time I really had that feeling of being encompassed by so much love by Mera, Mani, Gohair, Katie, all of them. And these were my aunties, and these were, you know, the women with whom I became so close, they arranged my wedding. I mean, it was just the beginning of a lifelong relationship. So they, of course, and, and all the hugs. Nobody hugs you like that in England, apart from your own family, but the hugs you get in India. So I was just hugged and everyone was pinching my cheek and so much affection. So then I remember we lined up uh, to meet Baba and suddenly garlands just kept coming out of nowhere. So I was given several garlands and, my, and um, I believe I was either behind or in front of my father. And again, it seemed like this interminable you know, time as we queued up to go into Mundley Hall to see Baba. And I had seen his foot and his robe. And I was you know, very curious. Well, my father, by, by this point, had given me very, very precise instructions about how I should greet Baba. Um, you know, I should hold the garland, place the garland on his lap, bow down, you know, move back, not throw myself at him, not hug him so on and so forth. So I remember being so nervous and clutching this garland to the point where it was just, you know, falling apart, with my eyes downcast and um, wanting to not trip, to not do the wrong thing. And uh, finally it was my turn, you know. And I went in and I had my head bowed and I saw Baba's feet and then I slowly looked up and sort of went up his legs and saw his face and he was just beaming, of course, and his arms were outstretched and I I think I threw the garland down and threw myself into it. And, um, you know, that was the beginning. I mean, I just, that was the beginning of my, you know, relationship with Baba. And um, it was also, it was an interesting time for me because, you know, my father was, I mean, he was very much the authority figure. He was very loving, but, you know, I did not, anything he said, I respected him tremendously. And instantly I knew that here was somebody who was even more important than my father. So what Baba said, went and it was like you had said I got a little oh you know this is this is nice so that was that was it that was the beginning and I can't you know I really can't do justice at all to the feeling of um, you know safety and love and the warmth of being surrounded by my loving family and you know in those days Merizad of course there were no pilgrims there were no residents it was just we were just going to see our family it was a home so there was no one else you know really running around it was very very intimate so, of course, from that moment, all I wanted to do was be with Baba. We were there for three months, and, you know, the Naujit had to be um, taken care of, but that was what I lived for, was to see Baba. I had cousins to play with, but I, you know, I played with them, but everything was, when are we going to Baba? And, uh, you know, every couple of days a message would come, or Baba would just send the car sometimes, and we would have to be ready, and we'd go. Of course, my father was there the entire time. So, um... As I said, Baba liked the idea of some entertainment, and you know, my, my father had said to me, well, what can you do? And I said, nothing, you know. And um, the only thing I could come up with at that point was to sing one of my school hymns. And I sang All Things Bright and Beautiful in Monthly Ball. And, um, you know, I remember feeling very self-conscious. And again, you know, when you're a child, everything's bigger. So Monthly Hall was huge. I could hear my voice, you know, bouncing around. I couldn't sing. But I did it, and that was sort of, that was the end of it. And I had taken Baba some drawings and some little craft items I had made. He was so sweet. Everything, you know, I gave him. And I know this is true for anybody who has done anything like this for Baba. I mean, it's not just my experience, but anything I gave him, however silly, he, he looked like it was the most beautiful, you know, diamond he'd been presented. He cherished it. And, um... You know, I used to play with him. I, I didn't know then how lucky I was, but I used to sit and play with Baba, and I would show him all of my toys. And I remember one time, um, I used to really like pushing him around in the wheelchair, and he was on the porch one time, and Mera and Money wanted me to come into the garden, because Money was just 
going to play a little game with me. You know where you hold a child and you swing the child around. So she wanted to do that with me. And I was very torn between wanting to do that with her but not wanting to leave Barbara. And I had um, bought a little cheap raffia handbag from the Ahmed Nagar Bazaar and I was very proud of it. And I didn't want to leave my handbag. And I remember sort of looking at Barbara and looking at money and looking at my handbag. And then I ran back to Barbara and I gave him my handbag. And he said he would look after it for me. And I, I ran away. And I have an image of Barbara, you know, in his wheelchair holding this handbag. Such a sweet look on his face. And I knew, you know, that I knew that my bag was safe, I was safe. It was such, such a feeling of safety. And he was so sweet, you know, and of course, again, I mean, I, I, I just, as far as I was concerned, that trip, I was the only one there, you know, and that wasn't true in the slightest. But Baba made me feel like, you know, I was just this indulged niece. He was my favorite uncle, you know, who also happened to be God. It was just beyond, beyond perfect. Um, I used to go into Baba's room a lot, and I loved his room because it was pink, you know. When I was a little girl, I loved all the, the pink bedspread, and I used to sit on his bed and we would play little finger games, Bob used to do that a lot. And then we would play, it wasn't a game, but it was something we used to do where, um, in England at the time, there was a sort of a funny trend, not trend, but men used to go to the seaside and instead of wearing hats, they'd take a large handkerchief and knot it, and if you've seen the Monty Python sketch, you know this. But anyway, so that was, you'd make a little hat with four, four knots in the corner. So Barbara and I would make hats out of hankies, and then we would exchange, and he'd put it on my head, and I'd put the hat on his head. And you know, we just played. And um, it, it was so wonderful. And my, you know, my images of Barbara in, the, in, in his room, Barbara in the garden, it was so beautiful. Marisol was so beautiful. And of course, always um, the Mara and money, you know, getting to know them. Um, there were times, of course, when I had been told by my father, you know, my, my dad was having to sort of let go a little bit, and um, he said, but look, you've got to leave Baba alone. When he's resting or napping, you mustn't disturb him. And I, you know, had, I understood that. So he would have his naps after lunch. And um, it was actually very sweet because it was my chance to really spend more time with Mary and Money, and that was how I got to know them and the other ladies. But one time, um, and to pass the time, I would sometimes ride Goher's bicycle, which actually fit me perfectly, you know, I was only seven, but it was just the right size for me. And I would ride around, you know, Merizard, and again, you know, Merizard seemed very big, you know, I'd never really been in such a big garden before, so I'd ride all over, and one day, I thought I had found, you know, a little secret path, and so I followed the secret path, and then I came upon some steps, and you know, of course I had read all the children's literature, so I was very much in this fantasy mode, and I realized I'd found a secret entrance to Barbara's room, and actually all it was was the side entrance, you know, but I had found this other way of getting into Barbara's room, so I realized where I was, and um, climbed the steps, put my bike down, you know, felt very naughty, because I hadn't, I was so well behaved, you know, to do something like this was very unusual for me. Peeked into his room, I could see his head, he was on the bed, and, um, you know, debating whether to leave or whether I'd be in trouble or go in, and then he saw me, and he beckoned and he said, come in. So I went in and, you know, sat on the bed and he was so sweet and we, we played and we talked and, you know, and then I left and never told anybody what I did. Of course, I'm sure everybody knew, you know, it was no secret, but I thought it was a secret time with Barbara. So I would occasionally do that. Um, one thing, I know other people have said this, but, you know, I always say that Barbara and I talked. I don't remember anybody ever interpreting for him, although, of course, you know, somebody did. And similarly, whenever I was in his bedroom, unless all of us were there, I don't remember anybody else being in his bedroom. You know, it was, it was just Barbara. Some of my happiest memories, or most significant memories, that visit actually revolved around food with Barbara. Um, we, we used to have lunch with him, and you know, Barbara would, um, for those who've been to India, Barbara would eat in the dining room with the ladies, and then the, the men would eat separately. So of course Barbara would sit at the head of the table and money, I used to call her money Fui, which Fui is father's aunt. And she was just so sweet and she would let me sit, father's sister, yeah. She would allow me to sit in her place. She would sit on Barbara's left and her auntie would sit on Barbara's right. So whenever I was there, I got the privilege of sitting on Barbara's left. 
So it was wonderful to sit next to Baba and eat with him. I mean, it was just such a, it was so intimate and cozy and private. And like I say, just being with a family, you know. And I mean, I was just in love with Baba. I was so enamored of him. You know, I knew he could do anything. I, I, I knew he was God. But he was so funny and he came, absolutely came to my level. He was, had a great sense of humor. He, so, um, a couple of things happened in the dining room, but early on in our, our visit, one thing I was very worried about, and Franey was concerned about it too, was, you know, I was a bit prissy and I had eaten, in, really only eaten English food and I didn't like Indian food. And at my grandparents, you know, I would sort of play with my food a bit and not eat it really. And um, so firstly, there was this concern about how would I do that, how would I cope, you know, with the food that... I was eating at Baba's table, I would be terrible to not eat it. But then, I was, uh, believe it or not, an extraordinarily thin seven-year-old, and Franey had been worried about my weight and my health, and spoke to Baba about me and said that I didn't eat, and I was, like to say, that's the beginning of my lifelong weight problem, and that's Franey's fault, she was kept quiet. But, um, anyway, so she had said this to Baba, so then, uh, rice and dal had been served that day, and I really didn't like dal and some Indian vegetable. And I was just oh. so. Of course, you know, you know, your your, pet, your mother is talking to Baba over you, and I'm sitting there just thinking, why is she saying this? You know. So then Baba looked at me very sweetly and said, Oh, so Shireen, you know, something along the lines of, you don't eat much. Well, you must eat. You must eat this food. And I said, Yes, Baba. And I looked at it, and then the conversation continued, and you know, it was just lunch conversation. And I was eating a little bit, but playing with it, and really did not like it at all. And then, you know, you start to worry you're going to be sick, and I thought, what will it be like if I'm sick at Barbara's table? Yeah. So he was, you know, he had this kind of twinkle in his eye, and looked at me every so often, and, you know, he would smile or do this, you know, look at the food. So then he said, do you like the food, Shireen? And it, I remember it was the first time I had that moral dilemma, you know, <laughs> what do I do? You know, I can't lie to Barbara. But it would be so rude to tell him I didn't like the food. And I, you know, I don't remember what I said, but I remember in my own mind I said something that was the best I could do with, without falling short either way. And then I looked away, Baba looked away, and then the next thing I knew, I had, Baba had said something or had indicated that I should look at him, and he had taken a huge handful of rice and dal. And I had turned to him, and for some reason my mouth was open, and he shoved the rice in. <laughs> and it was really a big mouthful, I mean, where I, I, I think I could have easily gagged. And, you know, it sounds too good to be true, but it went down and it tasted great. <laughs> Baba asked me if I liked it, and I said, oh, yes. <laughs> and needless to say, you know, I love, I love rice and dal. <laughs> Those times in the dining room were just so sweet. Another, another, you know, little sweet sort of uh, habit with food was in the afternoon. Baba, he would have tea, but he would, for some reason, he'd have a little bowl of vegetable soup after his nap in Mundley Hall, and he'd have it just in a bowl, and he'd drink it out of the bowl. And I would always be sitting by Baba's feet. You know, always I'd sort of make sure I got my position by his feet, and uh, he would drink about half the bowl, and then he would give me the rest, and I would finish. Um, his soup. And again, you know, I, that's the kind of thing I wouldn't have ordinarily liked, but it just, it tasted very creamy and it was, it was wonderful. And then another thing that happened in the dining room, which was, you know, again like nature said, I mean, Baba just knows, of course, exactly what you're thinking. And um, I, I was thinking, well, you know, this is wonderful being with Baba. It's, he's so sweet, but, you know, Baba can perform miracles and, um, you know, he's God, he can do anything. And I was sort of I wasn't wondering if he would do anything, but I, that thought was going through my mind. And um, as a special treat one day, uh, somebody had sent a tin of fruit salad. And believe it or not, in those days, that was quite a, quite a treat. Um, even in England, I think. I'm sure you could get it, but we didn't have it that often. So somebody had sent a really big tin of fruit salad. And uh, that was our lunch treat. And Barbara said, you know, we've got a special special pudding today, special dessert today, fruit salad, so I was very pleased about that. And you know, if you've ever had a tin of fruit salad, you know that inside there are a few cherries, and that's what everybody wants, they want the cherries, and then there's the rest of it. So, um, 
you know, did, uh, lunch was finished and it was time for dessert and Baba said to me, um, Shireen, do you like cherries? And I said, oh yes, Baba. And he said, oh good. So then I think it was Katie who was serving and he said to Katie, give Shireen all the cherries. So of course I was really chuffed. I was so <laughs> all the cherries. So we were all handed our bowls and I ate the cherries first. And Baba was smiling, smiling, and he said, Shireen, was that good? Did, did you like the cherries? I said, oh, yes, Baba. And he said, would you like some more? And I said, oh, yes, you know. And I was half hesitant because, of course, the English girl in me was, you know, you mustn't ask for more, but, oh, yes, you know, I, I would love more cherries. And uh, so Baba said to Katie, you know, please give Shireen some more cherries. And Katie said, well, I think I gave her everything, but I'll look. Because it was, a, she had emptied the bowl, and uh, the can into a bowl. So she went back and sure enough, there were a few more cherries, so I was given the cherries and I ate them. And Bob was looking at me, beaming, and um, he said, do you like the cherries? And I said, oh yes, Father. And he said, do you like some more, wouldn't you? And I said, yes. yes. <laughs> and so uh, he said to Katie, you know, I'm never quite sure if it was Katie or Goha, but I think it was Katie. Give, give Shereen more cherries. And she said, oh no, Baba, I've given her all the cherries. And he said, no, no, just go and have a look. So she got up and she looked, and lo and behold, there were more cherries. And, you know, it, it happened, I don't remember, but it happened numerous times. And when I talked to Money about it last, we were just sort of reminiscing, and she said, you know, it was an endless production of cherries. And I, said, I wanted, and I was just so thrilled, because, and, you know, I had known that I, want, I had been hoping for some little, you know, we can do this. And yet, you know, it was, it was so funny because the ladies were looking somewhat askance, but I was not because I knew Baba could do this. Baba was a magician, and this is what, you know, I was very pleased by it. So it was like a little joke. It was just lovely. It was really, really, really sweet. Well, I did, um, I'm not sure when in the trip, but I asked Baba questions. And um, you know some of which have been uh, written up in some of the books, but um, the question that uh, my friend and I had come up with, I think, was the first one I put to him. And uh, you know I don't remember exactly the sequence because it, it's sort of the grown-ups who talked about this more. But I don't remember, apart from this particular question, you know I don't remember thinking to myself, well, here's my chance to ask God everything I want to know. I mean I did think that in a broad sense, you know He can tell me everything, but I believe that when I came up with these questions, they were pretty spontaneous, and certainly my father had no idea that I was going to ask them. And my poor dad, I mean, I think for any parent, you know, I often say this, for any, any parent who's taken their ch child or children to meet the Mundali, and that slight anxiety you feel, is my child going to behave, is my child going to show me up? Well, I mean, my parents must have felt it tenfold, because they were taking me to meet Baba, and I had been raised in the West, so I was the only one, you know, I'm sure they were really wanting me to make a good impression. And um, my nature of personality was not to be bold, it was not to be inquisitive. Um, and I basically didn't speak unless I was spoken to, but in front of Baba, for whatever reason, I just, all of these questions came out of me. But the one that my friend and I wanted to, to know the answer to was, um, well, first of all, so we were in Mundley Hall, and then I'm not quite sure how it transpired, but it, I asked somebody if I could ask Baba questions. or. I'm not exactly sure, but I remember my father, you know, just a slight little twitch, and then he sort of was very calm, but I could tell he was, his radar were out, you know, in case I asked something inappropriate or embarrassing or silly. So the first question from my friend and um, for me was, we wanted to know which is higher, the stars, the moon, the sun, or the sky? And I asked Baba this, I remember very solemnly, and I remember standing in front of him, and asking him and um, he looked for a minute and then he had a kind of a look of concentration on his face you know so I knew he was taking me really seriously and then he looked up at me and he said I am the highest of the high ah. <laughs> <laughs> which was you know the perfect answer but I still wanted to know which was actually higher <laughs> so then I think I asked most of them in one day but perhaps over a series of days um, and I know, it just it was like a, a, a dam had burst, you know, all this. So I asked him about reincarnation, and I asked him, um, I said to him, Baba, I know that we are born again and again, 
but you know you are God why why are you here in human form and he explained that you know God for his love of man comes in human form and comes again and again to help man that it's not the same as as the way humans reincarnate and in that same vein I then became very concerned about when I were to die would I have the same parents and Baba said no I wouldn't have the same parents and I asked if I could have a brother or a sister, and he said, no. He said, you're enough for your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I had Dara, I mean, Dara is my brother, but I wanted a baby, very, very much. Um, I asked him, um, oh gosh, I've looked at my notes, I've forgotten so many of the questions. Oh, I was very concerned about witches because, as I said, I believed in absolutely everything, you know. Uh, I had a very impressionable mind, you know, Mary Poppins, Peter Pan, everyone. And witches um, were very, I was very worried about them. So I asked Baba if witches were real. And by this time, you know, there was such a familiarity between Baba and me, and um, I felt so comfortable asking him these questions. And as I asked the question, I was quite convinced he would just stop me halfway and say, of course not, you know, and put my mind at rest. So I asked, I asked him in, in full, and he looked very concerned, and didn't answer me immediately. And I remember looking at him thinking, well, why isn't he putting my mind at rest? And then he looked at me quite solemnly, and he said, yes. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> this isn't at all what I was expecting to hear. And he said, witches are bad people. They're people who mean to harm you. And I said, oh. And he said, you know, there are good people in the world and there are bad people in the world, and witches are the bad people. And I said, all right. And I said, but do you mean that they aren't wearing hats and flying out on brooms and casting spells? And he said, no, that kind of witch doesn't exist. So from then on, I knew that that, I didn't have to worry about that. But he, my, he answered me, you know, at my level. So whatever the seriousness was in me, he, he met that and responded to it. So he never... You know, sometimes if a child asks somebody something the child is patronized to, Baba didn't do that at all. I felt I could trust him implicitly with uh, his answers. And then I asked him many other questions. I asked him about um, why there was a painting of Baba in Mundy Hall, and the painting had a halo. And I asked him why I could see the halo on the painting, but I couldn't see the halo around Baba. And Baba said that when I loved him as he truly was meant to be loved, I would see the halo. Mm -hmm. And so I, had th I thought about that, and then um, a few days later, or sometime later, I think at lunch, I told Money and Mera that I wanted a magic wand, because I had been very intent on having a magic wand, and I never, I thought it would really be cheeky to ask Barbara for that, so I didn't <laughs> ask him. But I wanted that more than anything in my life, actually, after seeing Barbara with a magic wand. So I told Mera and Money, and um, one of them said, what would you do with the magic wand? And I said, I would see Barbara with his halo, and love him as he um, is meant to be loved. And then another question I asked him, which... I didn't get the wand. No. <laughs> Still waiting for that. So then I asked him, uh, uh, and this had been really pressing, and I still don't know to this day why I was so concerned. You know, having been raised in England, where the worst creature you would see would be a spider, I suppose, I had um, an extraordinary fear of snakes, and I'm phobic to this day about snakes, and creatures and scorpions, and I think, you know, I had perhaps read a little bit about India, I mean, India was so exotic, here I was living in suburban London, and, or the suburbs of London, and going to India, so I had built up a tremendous fear about scorpions and snakes particularly, and um, so I asked Barbara one day why he had made snakes and scorpions, and, you know, by this time, I, I really was feeling quite familiar and safe and secure with Baba, and I actually expected him to sort of say, oh, you don't like them, you know, I'll get rid of them, it's no problem. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm really feeling a bit, you know, it's probably a good thing my father was in the background, you know, just like, keeping a rain on me. And uh, Baba then gave me a, quite a long answer, and it was sort of a two-part answer. He first of all said, well, what about them? What happens when you see them? And funny enough, I've never actually seen them, you know, <laughs> except perhaps in picture books. He said, what happens if you were to see a snake or a scorpion? And I said, I'd be very frightened. And he said, well, what do you do when you're frightened? And I said, I think of you, Barbara. And he said, well, 
He said, you know, sometimes people need to be frightened, they need to be scared and afraid in order to think of me. They don't think of me all the time. And, you know, of course that made absolute sense. So that was the first um, part of the, the, quest, the answer. But then I, I must have still had a look on my face or seen perturbed or something. And so then Baba said, um, he said, well, you know, Shireen, he said, he said, look at you, you know, you're so sweet and pretty. But when you go to the bathroom, what comes out isn't sweet and pretty. <laughs> and I always see now, you have to, I mean, I was from England, and or just to even talk about that was so embarrassing, so I was <laughs> so taken aback. He said, just, just, you know, but if you didn't do that, you'd become ill, and you wouldn't be sweet and pretty. And he said, so in order for you to be sweet and pretty, you need to go to the bathroom. And he said, it's the same with creation, that both good and bad are mine, and it's all part of creation. And, you know, he said it, of course, I mean, I can't begin to say it the way he did, but it, it absolutely made sense. You know, I still was very worried about snakes and scorpions, and actually developed even more of a phobia about snakes after that. But he answered me so thoroughly, and, um, you know, it, it just felt so wonderful to be taken so seriously by a grown-up, and especially by somebody who I knew what he said was the absolute truth. You know, I could put that question to rest now. So another um, way that Baba and I used to spend time together was, he, he really um, loved Mustan, I'm sure most of you know that, his dog. And Mustan was beautiful and very, very big. And I was, you know, seven and Mustan seemed enormous to me, the size of a horse. And I was really quite frightened of him. And uh, Baba, you know, loved him so much. So Baba wanted me to become friends with Mustang. So he would ask me if I would, you know, pet him, and I very gingerly would. And then what Baba had me do it was so clever. Mustang would have a raw egg every morning for breakfast, and Baba would have me give him the egg. And uh, you know, there's a photo of me. Really, I mean, I couldn't be further away from him giving him this egg. But we became we became good friends, and Baba seemed so happy about that. And then later, um, I wanted a dog, and Baba, you know, like he did with so many people I know, took a very active interest in our dog, the dog, and he would send, would include our dogs in, in telegrams even, and Baba loved animals very much. So then, um, the next thing to tell you about that time, oh, one little thing, I mean, and again, I keep <laughs> remembering your talk later, but, you know, after two or three months with Baba, I mean, I just, everything was Baba, and Baba was showering me with attention. I mean, he, he just was. And of course, I lapped it up, I loved it. Well, one day, you know, my universe changed, because um, Begum Akhtar, Akhtar, the very famous singer, came to sing for Baba in Mandali Hall. So suddenly, you know, the car had come as usual, everything. I was geared up, I had my toys, I had everything, my games, I was ready to see Baba. And I couldn't see him. And there were people there, and I was really, <laughs> what's going on? And uh, she was performing a concert in Monthly Hall for him. And so I didn't have my usual place, you know, by his feet, and it was all different. And um, it seemed to me that I had been seated right at the end, you know. I couldn't have been further away from Baba in order to listen to her. And just when I was sitting there feeling a bit, you know, tearful, and thinking, Baba's forgotten me, and what's happened and what have I done, you know. At that point, Baba leaned right back in his chair. And I had been looking over at him, and he, he leaned back and he saw me and he went like that. And it was so sweet, because I knew then, I knew he hadn't forgotten me and he'd been thinking of me. And that I had to be more grown up about it, you know, that I couldn't be so demanding of his attention. Um, Baba gave me gifts, which was wonderful. He gave me... Um, an Australian barber lover had given him a little stuffed koala bear, and he gave me that, and I still have her, and her name's Doris. And he gave me a beautiful golden music box that I still have. And he would he would give me he would give me soap, uh, which I have obviously I haven't used. Um, so the other thing to tell you about that time was this Naja ceremony, and. Uh, it was really interesting, and of course, at the time, I didn't—I wouldn't have known to see any significance in it. I, I, I see significance in it now, but you know, I—I I don't really know. But uh, it's a very complex, you know, ceremony. There are many, many prayers to be learned. I didn't speak a word of Persian, so one of the reasons we went to India for three months was so that I would have a chance to learn the Persian prayers 
um, talk to me by the priest. And in fact, the priest would come to my grandparents' house, and that meant I couldn't see Baba. So I was, you know, my sort of attitude towards the priest and towards learning these Persian prayers. I mean, of course, I was respectful, but it wasn't my heart and soul weren't in it at all because it was taking me away from time with Baba. And um, anyway, I, I did learn them somewhat. And the a day of the Nadrat approach, and an Nadrat ceremony is like a wedding, it's huge, you know, and it was a very, very grand affair. And, you know, uh, everybody in the town came, everyone who was important. So, um, the morning, you know, I have to go back, about a week before the Nadrat ceremony, or maybe 10 days on one of our visits to Baba, Baba asked Franey if I knew the Pravadigar prayer, which, you know, for a seven-year-old is quite a challenge, I think. And she said no. So Baba said, well, Shireen should learn it. And she should learn it by so-and-so date. And it was the morning of my Nadrat. And so I had to learn all these Zoroastrian prayers and the Pravadigar prayer. And, you know, Franey just thought, there's no way that I can do this. Um, so we decided that the only opportunity we really had was I had this tremendously long hair and it would take for any, you know, 40 minutes or so to comb it and do it in the morning, was that while she was combing my hair, I'd learn the prayer. So I always associate the prayer with my hair. <laughs> and um, anyway, I learned it. So it was either the morning of the Nadrat or the morning before. But I went to Mandali Hall, and Baba asked if I had learned the prayer, and I said yes, and I was very nervous, and, um, you know, wanted to get it right, and I remember I stood on a little stool in front of him, and I put my hands together, and I said the prayer, and thankfully I said it perfectly, and I've actually, I won't say I have a photographic memory, but I'm actually pretty good at remembering things and reciting things, and I always think it's because of that. You know, I, did, I used to do drama, and I could learn things you know, the night before. Um, so then the Nauja, well, so, you know, the important prayer had been said, but the Nauja was also important. Yes, and then the, the, the Nauja ceremony was held in the afternoon. So that morning, Baba wanted me to come to Marizad with all the, you know, when I say me, of course, it's all the family. And um, he performed what we considered to be the real Nauja ceremony. It was just very simple. It was just the family, the Mandali. Um, in, in, with the Nadrat, you wear, for the first time, a sadra, you all know what that is, and a kasti, which is a thread that you wear around your waist, it's a sacred thread, and you only take it off to say prayers, you put it back on. So, um, this is what I was going to be given during my Nadrat ceremony. But with Baba I went in the morning, and he handed me the sadra, and he wrapped the kasti, he put the sadra on me, and he wrapped the kasti around me, and it was very sweet, and very quick and simple. And I said the Pavadi Girl Pro again, and that was it, and then we left. And then later that afternoon, it couldn't have been more different. It was, you know, day and night. I mean, I was dressed up to the nines, and uh, there was a very big ceremony. And I had to say all of my Zoroastrian prayers on a dais with the priest, and I got all of them wrong. <laughs> so, you know, here I, I wasn't able to do that. Um, even though I, I really had tried, and I remember, you know, the family after it was all over, various family members would come and hug me, and you know how they do garlands and everything. And one of my aunts, not a not a Baba lover, one of my aunts, you know, whispered and she said, "You said everything wrong, Shreen." <laughs> and I remember thinking, "Well, you know, but I did say the Pavadi prayer <laughs> correctly." Um, so I probably should actually just wrap it up. I mean, there's a second visit, but there isn't. Uh, there isn't time for that. Um, told you about the cherries. Oh, one thing that happened this trip that was really just great for me. Um, and again, it's like the time that you felt your parents' authority was lessening slightly when you met Barbara. But, um, my father must have just decided that I was really annoying Baba or being too, you know, too much of a pest or something. So Baba had sent the car to fetch Franey wait for me. Um, and again, it's like the time that you felt your parents' authority was lessening slightly when you met Baba. But um, my father must have just decided that I was really annoying Baba or being too, you know, too much of a pest or something. So, Baba had sent the car to fetch Franey 
and me and probably Dara. And Adi usually would come. He'd usually come in the car and, you know, spend some time with us and my grandparents and then we'd all go back together. Well, I, I must have done something, so my father wouldn't take me. So I was all dressed up, you know, with nowhere to go. I was dressed up to see Barbara and my dad said, no, you're not coming. And, uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure he wasn't being mean. I probably, it was probably quite legitimate. Um, so they went and I was left um, behind with my grandparents and I was very upset, of course. And then, I don't know how much time passed, but the car came back, and, um, and then my dad, to his credit, you know, he, he told the story, and he was completely, he said, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have left you behind. Barbara, apparently, you know, everyone had arrived, and Barbara had said, where's Shireen? And my dad said, oh, I thought, Barbara, she was being a bit irritating, you know, perhaps troubling to you too much. And Barbara said, no, send the car back and get her. And you can imagine what that did for me, you know. <laughs> On every level, I, I felt so, you know, proud and sort of proud. And of course, I said to my father, see, see you know, it, it was definitely there was a sh slight shift in my relationship with my father after that. Well, I'll just keep going until you haven't given me the signal yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, Well, second trip, so I've got 20 minutes. So the time came for us to leave. And, you know, saying goodbye to Barbara was just the most awful thing. I mean, having spent that kind of time with him, it was very hard for me to imagine, you know, what it would be like to go back and to go back to the so-called normal life, which really wasn't the normal life. You know, being there was the normal life. But, um, you know, Barbara was very sweet and said, no, no, you've got to go back, you've got to go back to school. And, I, you know, I remember asking him, why can't I stay here? Why am I the only one? Why are we the only family to be in the West? And Barbara said, well, I want you in the West, and I want you educated in the West. So, you know, he sort of um, pacified me in that way. And uh, we left and came back to England, and life resumed. And um, there isn't time, there's something that happened in between, and there isn't time for that. Uh, but anyway, um, in the interim between leaving Barbara in 1963 or 64 and going back in 1968, I had been accepted and had started um, at a school called St. Paul's Girls School, which Barbara had actively uh, arranged for me to go to. And it was where Kitty Davy had gone to school and he wanted me to go to school there. And Duncan had played a part in it. But anyway, um, so then in 1968, um, it was Dara's wedding. And Dara, my brother, he was, you know, living at home, and Barbara had arranged his wedding, I'm sure many of you know, with Umbrit, Kumar's daughter. So again, great excitement, you know, we were going back to India, back to see Barbara, and I was so happy. Um, we couldn't go for very long, because my school was so strict, they wouldn't allow me to take extra time off for the, the Christmas holidays, so um, I think we were just there for three and a half or four weeks. And... Um, it was really different for me. My anticipation and expectation and my approach, you know, it's amazing what can happen in four years. But, you know, 11 is not seven. And at 11, you know, you think more. And I was much more uh, conscious of, I mean, that's the wrong word. I wasn't conscious of who I was. But I was more aware that I was going to meet God. And God was my uncle. And how on earth did that happen? You know, I, I, surely that, that seemed impossible. And um, I also knew that he was very ill, that he had been ill. And um, I was just more self-conscious. You know, I had, I had grown up that little bit more. I, mean, I hadn't always been, you know, the perfect student or whatever. I just was feeling very vulnerable that Baba would see right through me and any bad thought I'd ever had, you know, would come right out. But I was tremendously excited too. Um, I had also gained some weight, you know, thanks to... Franey's efforts, I had actually some puppy fat, so I was rather self-conscious about my, the way I looked as well. But really that did help, you know, into nothingness. I was so excited to see Barbara. So, it was the same scenario. My father gave me the same set of instructions, and he said, you know, this time, Shireen, Barbara really is, he's frail. He's, this is just before he dropped his body, of course. Um, you know, you mustn't hug him. And I was more mature, I was going to, you know, abide by that. And we arrived, the same sort of, you know, the cars, the garlands, all of that. Barbara was in his room, I believe, when we met him 
in 1968. And that in itself alerted me that, you know, he really was ill. And so I was really was determined to not hug him and to not in any way disturb him. But again, he was sitting up on the bed and, you know, I went in with my gun and it was just like a replay, you know. His arms were open and I, how could I not hug him? You know, I, I went and I hugged him, but a little more, more gingerly. And it was just as though no time had passed whatsoever. It was just right back to square one. And he was as sweet as ever. It was a, different in that there was more activity, you know, there was a wedding to arrange. Um, I was very excited about that because I knew Bob had said I wouldn't have a brother or sister, but I thought, well, you know, Darren, I'm really getting married, there'll be a baby, and I'll have a nephew or a niece. So I was really thrilled about the wedding. But I was definitely aware of Barbara's illness and that it wasn't quite the same in terms of, you know, him being out and about as much, but still we spent so much time together. And um, I, oh, several things happened, so I'll have to pick. Um, well, one thing, um, again, I found my way to his room when he was resting. And, you know, I, we would just talk, I would sit on the bed, and it was just the same as before we played the, the games and so on. But one time he surprised me, and he looked at me and he said, um, what do you think is the most important thing you can do for me? And I was really taken aback because I had, you know, Barbara would ask me questions. He asked me about school and, um, you know, all sorts of things. He would ask about life in England. But this seemed a very direct and sort of purposeful question. And I felt it was loaded, you know. I just thought, oh, I've really got to answer this properly. And so in my mind I thought, well, what are the two things to do for Barbara, to love him or to obey him? And I thought, you know, to love you is easy. So to, be, to obey you is the most important thing I can do. And I said that to him. And he looked at me, you know, I'll never forget this, he looked at me so sweetly and, you know, cut my face and all of that. And he said, and he said no, I know he, he didn't mean no, don't obey me, but he said, no, I want you to be happy. And even at that age, I was really, you know, I felt, this is amazing, you know, that Bob is saying this to me as his wish for me to be happy. I also you know, very naively thought he was waving a magic wand and that he was granting me a charmed life because I thought he was saying, you will be happy, you know, you're going to just have everything you want. And, you know, little did I know what he was saying was, be happy despite everything. But I, I really feel that sort of set the, you know, but I mean, I feel that set the tone for my life with Barbara after that and with all the various challenges, you know, that we do face. And that was very, very touching. I just remember feeling such compassion and tenderness and, and feeling so moved that he would say that. And it was a very private, intimate moment. Um, uh, two things occurred that felt very significant at the time and to me still feel significant. Barbara had, you know, like I said, and everyone who was close to Barbara is the same, you just didn't do anything without asking Barbara. Certainly not anything important, but even some things that would seem trivial and that might seem a waste of Barbara's time. We asked Barbara, even from England, and you know, telegrams would go back and forth about really mundane, you know, prosaic sort of everyday things. And you just somehow intuitively knew what should be asked of Barbara and what shouldn't. But there was always that feeling of error on the side of caution. So I remember as a child, endless letters, telegrams going back and forth, back and forth. And one thing that had come up, um, on my visit when I was seven, but then particularly in 1968, before we went to India, Baba was in seclusion in 68, but he called my father to India for about six weeks to talk to him about, I don't know, about things, but also Dara and Amrit's wedding. And, um, of course, while Baba was in seclusion, my, my father would see him, but nobody could communicate with Baba, so we would communicate with my father, and my father would relay information to Baba. It was during this time that the whole business of my school was going on. But um, I really wanted to cut my hair. I had this long Indian hair and I wanted to be like an English girl. And Baba had really shown, you know, a great love of my hair, shall we say, when I was seven. So ever since he sort of expressed that, even little hint that he liked my hair, Ideen Frady said, you know, you're not going to cut your hair because Baba liked it. Well, then I pestered them, and um, 
When my father was in India, I thought, you know, this is my opportunity. My dad's there. I'll write to my dad and ask him to ask Baba, please let me cut my hair. And Freddie and I sort of agreed, and we kind of, we initiated that in a way. Um, so Freddie wrote, or I wrote, the message went to Baba, and a postcard frame came from my father. And the first thing I wrote was, Baba has granted your wish, you can cut your hair. And I thought, oh, yippee. You know? And then it was, you can cut eight inches. Well, eight inches on hair that's down to here is a trim. <laughs> and so that was very frustrating. And also, it had been sort of set now that I couldn't do anything with my hair unless we had permission from Baba. So I was a bit frustrated. And when we went to India and saw him, um, you know, I would wear my hair in two plaits, and Baba commented on my hair, and he liked it, all of this, and I was just longing to get it cut. And Mera was very sympathetic. Mera always, you know, she understood women, and she understood, you know, the wish to sort of feel right and look right, and she was very sympathetic. Well, I um, talked to Mera about it, and I think she, I asked her to talk to Baba, yes, because I knew that Baba wouldn't refuse Mera anything. <laughs> you know, I mean, looking back, of course, I feel, oh, how could I be so silly, Baba, you know, as if this is so unimportant. He had enough things to think about. The wedding, you know, nobody even knew if he, I mean, he was so ill that there was that fear that he couldn't even come out for the wedding. And, of course, just a few weeks later, he dropped his body, but I was fixated on my hair. So I asked my auntie, she asked Baba. And even as I was asking her, I felt a little funny, you know, I felt this isn't right, but I did pursue it. And then the message came back that Baba said, yes, you can cut your hair. And, you know, immediately it was, oh, no, you no, know, I want to go back. I don't want to do this. I mean, I was, I was, I should say, I was very elated too, because I got my wish and I knew I'd get that hair chopped off, but there was that feeling in me that I had made a mistake, that I shouldn't have pushed it, you know, I should have just left well enough alone. Um, but anyway, it was done. So Barbara said, yes, you can cut your hair, and then the message came that it had to be that day or the next day, and that as soon as Franey had to do it, and as soon as it was done, I had to come and see him. And most importantly, it couldn't be below shoulder length. So we went back to Franey's parents' house, to my grandparents, and they had to have this beautiful big balcony. We sat outside, and my hair was in one thick plait. And Franey took the scissors, and you know, I don't know how many feet dropped of my hair dropped off, and I felt this sort of thud, and just my heart sank. It, it just. And then I think I had to immediately. The car came, and immediately I had to, I saw Baba, and um, you know I was I couldn't help but be also proud of my new look, you know. But I had this funny feeling inside of me. And I went to see him, and I stood in front of him, and I just remember he had a sad expression on his face. And he, he put his hand under my hair like this, and he said, like this, no shorter. And he was very sweet, and he said, oh, it's nice, it looks nice, how will you do it? He said all the right things, as it were, but I knew that I had made a mistake. So I felt very sorry about that. But I then went on to make another mistake on the same trip. Um, and I don't know whether I should tell you that story or the jokes. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sort of telling the story because, you know, this must have happened to countless people. It happened to me as a child. But Baba teaches us lessons, you know, all the time. Oh, but about the hair, years later, Mani said, she said, you know, it was your fault. She said, people ask Baba things, and they ask him for things. And once you ask, once you open your mouth, it's out there. She said, be very careful what you wish for with Baba. So, um, anyway, uh, when I was seven, I had very much wanted to climb Seclusion Hill. And I don't know why, I just wanted to do it, everybody else was doing it. And Baba said, no. He said, you're frightened of snakes and scorpions. Why would you want to? No. So he said, no. So then when I was 11, I, it came up again, and I wanted to climb Seclusion Hill. And I think I, I knew that everybody, meaning Dara Amra, everyone was going on a sort of expedition um, after the wedding. And I very much wanted to be included. So Baba said, all right, you know. And of course, I was too young to know. You know, I had made my second mistake, but um, so it was a big event. It was really exciting. We were going to go picnic. Some servants came with us, and again, you know, to me, it was like climbing a mountain. It's really not that far, but it felt like that. Well, I don't quite know what happened with my mum and me, but I wasn't dressed for this. I was wearing a little skirt and sandals, and I remember I had a blouse and an angora or a mohair, very fluffy cardigan. So off I went. Well, you know, I was frightened of heights. So this was another reason why it was ridiculous for me to do this. 
So we all went, there were so many of us. And I started going along and I was fine. And then, you know, I thought, well, we're going higher and higher and this isn't coming to an end. And um, I stopped and I looked down and I went into um, a panic with the, the, the fear of heights. And, you know, my father kind of came to me and said, all right, come on, come on. And I said, no, no, I can't, I can't. Well, he pulled me, we went a little further. And then I looked down again and I became hysterical. I looked down, I looked up, I couldn't go down, I couldn't go anywhere, you know, and everybody was trying to convince me to move one way or the other. And I made a total spectacle of myself, because then what happened was I became so, I don't know if you know, anyone who's been in that situation, you lose your sort of grip on reality, and I became very panicked, and I sort of did a little twirl, I didn't know where to go, and then I tripped and I landed in a sort of cactus bed of thorns. So then I started rolling around on that because I was upset. And became even, I became you know, embedded with thorns and that was hurting and I'd roll around some more. So, you know, I'm rolling around, screaming, carrying on on Barbara's Hill. With everyone looking at me and my father thinking, oh. <laughs> you know, and, and feeling like I was this little precious English girl who should have no business being up there, you know. So, um, anyway, they sort of extracted me from the thorns and I was in absolute agony. I don't know how many of those things I had in me. And then some of the servants on my father, anyway, I was carried down. So I was carried down Seclusion Hill, wearing a skirt, you know, my legs everywhere, carrying on, having a fit. So I was so shamefaced because once I had got to the bottom, I felt safe, and then I felt so humiliated and bad that I had made such a fuss. So I was immediately taken to that little room. If you've been, you know, you go into Marisol, and there's a tiny room right at the front. And there's a bed, I think. So I was put there, and then Gohan and Mara came, and I think money came. And they spent, I don't know how long, tweezing these, um, pulling these thorns out of the tweezers. And I was crying, and, you know, I wasn't writhing around at this point. I just felt so bad, and so, like, I'd made everyone, you know, cause trouble and everything. And it, I was in a lot of pain. And I still have the cardigan, and it has all the thorns oh. in it. So they did the best they could, and then the message came that Barbara wanted to see me. And you know, my face was red and swollen, I had sort of puffed up, I just was, it, it was just horrible. So I, you know, got off the bed and went to see Barbara. And he was sitting there on his bed, and he was so sweet, and this huge smile on his face, and his arms were outstretched, and he gave me a hug. He didn't make any comment about my appearance or anything. And, um, you know, I was sort of sniffling, and as you do, and um, then I stood there with him, and he looked at me very sweetly, and he said, um, did you like going up seclusion? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, um, and again, you know, what, what to say, I don't know, I something. And then he started asking more questions. Oh, did you, what, did you like the view? Did you see any flowers? You know, absolutely innocent, just this, as if he was, you know, asking me for the first time. And I was mortified, you know, but anyway, it was finished, and then he embraced me again. He was so sweet. I think it might have been then. He, Barbara and Mero gave me a gift together, which was this beautiful blue necklace, which um, I wore on my wedding day. Anyway, I think it might have been then. He did something, I remember, to make me feel not quite so, you know, idiotic. <laughs> so then I went, we went back, and, and I don't remember what the, the, the passage of time was, but I later learned that the entire time we'd been going, Barbara had asked Mero to stand with binoculars and he said, go and see how Shireen is doing in climbing seclusion hill. So she was giving him a blow-by-blow -blow <laughs> <film. laughs> Shireen's having a fit, Shireen's in the capture, Shireen's in the capture, Shireen's in the capture. And he knew all of that. And, you know, he, he asked, and yet he asked me with this sort of innocent, you know, way, well, how was it? And just imagine, you know, Mero saying, well, Barbara, oh, you know, I can see her now. She's crawling on the ground and now she's writhing on the ground and she's screaming and now she's hitting her father, whatever it was I was doing. So Barbara just, all of that, so of course, you know, years later, I thought, why, why, why didn't I just listen? Barbara said no, it should have been no, you know, but I was a child, so that's my, uh, you know, that's my excuse. Um, I think I have to, yeah, I should stop. So... I'll, I can tell the jokes at some other time and then... And then uh, can you just say something of how it was for you when Baba dropped the spot? Oh, 
Well, it was, it was awful. I mean, we, when we um, left Barber, it was tremendously sad in a way that it hadn't been beforehand. And then it felt like the time was too quick and um, and also Barbara, you know, he gave me a couple of orders. I mean, he gave me the order about my hair and another order about not reading any of his books. And I thought there was a certain finality to this because I thought, why is he telling me these things now? And when we went to say goodbye to him, you know, he, he embraced us all very lovingly for a very long time. I remember, you know, he said um, t t it was very important that I do well in school. Um, and then I asked him, um, I, I felt very worried that I wasn't going to see him again. So I asked him if next time I came to India, could I stay with him like my daddy, you know? And he said yes. So I thought, well, that's it then, I'm okay, you know? He's, he wouldn't have said that if he's not going to be here. So that gave me some reassurance. When we went back on the plane, um, I hadn't been thinking about anything, but I burst into tears and started crying very loudly, and Franey asked me what was the matter, and I said, we're not going to see Barb again, and then, you know, a few weeks later, he dropped his body, and it's, you know, it just felt like the bottom of the world had fallen out. I mean, I, I, I thought, I actually thought the world would end. I didn't understand how the world could continue. Mm. The world, you know, I was thinking in terms of life, and I, I remember in the morning when my dad told me, um, because the news had come in the evening, at night, and the phone call had come, and I remember being half awake and my father, hearing my father, it was a terrible connection, you know, our DK was telling him the news, and I remember my father was crying, and then he was actually swearing, he was using swear words like, you know, this can't be true, but I wasn't fully awake, so I thought I was dreaming, and then the next morning my dad called us down and he said to me, you know, he said, you know, Jesus died on the cross, and, um, uh, you know, Baba has, has dropped his body and he's gone. And, um, you know, we just couldn't believe it. And then my father that day went to India. And I was supposed to go to school the next day, I'm not sure, for the entombment. And I remember saying to Frankie, well, why, why am I going to school? There's no school. There's no such thing, you know. And it took, so it took me a long time to realize that the world was going to continue. And then it was how do we continue? And how do we, you know, um, go on? And, um, you know, we didn't go to India again for six years, so I was a young woman when we went the next time. So that first trip was extraordinarily hard. But one beautiful thing happened, I don't want to take up the time though. I should stop. Well, several amazing things happened, but one, and this is just for us, you know, imagine for everybody, I mean, we might be a bit so for us, you know, because Barbara reaches everybody. When we had been in India, um, or when my dad had been in India in 1968, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but Adi had asked Ranu to do a mastery in servitude, you know, painting for us. And the idea was that she was going to send it to us to, to London, which, you know, sending something by email from India anyway is a bit of a risk. But the day that Bob, we learned Barbara had dropped his body, that very day, that mastery in servitude, painting arrived, mm -hmm. and you know, for, for it just to arrive anyway, it was sort of half of a miracle. But then later, Ranu told her, she said, when she did that painting, Baba went and touched the, each uh, symbol for a really long time and lovingly sort of caressed the painting and just, you know, touched the painting. And she said he did it in, in a way that he'd never done before. And she was extremely reluctant to send it to us and almost wasn't going to, and then felt she had to honor her promise. And it, you know, it arrived the day he dropped his body. So th you know, things like that, you know, happen and happened. Hmm? It's with us. So anyway, I should really end. But I, anyway, give up. <laughs>